interesting and the work that we plan to do very interesting. So thank you all. And of course, a special thanks to Mary and the team at uh, the Jobs Knowledge Platform for hosting this as well. So uh, great, uh, greatly uh, indebted to all of you for this. Uh, I'm just going to say a quick word about, of course, the entire process here uh, and what we're trying to do, and then introduce Mary, and then uh, we can start off. Mary, uh, you can you can grab the reins from there. Uh, so of course, as um, the participants on the Hangout know, and uh, probably some of the people who are joining in as well. Uh, the, the World Bank's ICT team, the Information and Communication Technologies team, is interested in understanding what the links are between ICTs today and employment opportunities mm -hmm. and the world of work. Um, the big question that we're trying to address uh, really breaks down into two parts. Uh, the first being that how ICTs in and of themselves as a means of production and consumption influence employment directly. Uh, and the second is where ICTs are now beginning to enable and empower workers around the world to access new employment opportunities, are making labor markets more innovative and transparent, and truly including more people in the world of work. So we're really excited about these possibilities, and we're trying to summarize where the world is going today. And at the end of the day, given the focus of the World Bank, really understand what governments could be doing to enable this and to really expand those opportunities to a greater extent, include more people, and really get uh, the world back to work. So uh, I'm going to, uh, again, I'm looking forward very much to all of your perspectives. And uh, in fact, I'm going to now hand it off to Mary to, uh, to take the reins. Uh, and let me actually just introduce her very quickly. Uh, Mary Hallward Rimaya is the uh, joint uh, team leader uh, for the Jobs Knowledge Platform. She's a lead economist at the World Bank and has been with the bank for many years. And uh, again, I'm truly grateful to her and the Jobs Knowledge Platform team for hosting uh, this Google Hangout. So Mary, I'm going to hand this over to you. And of course, I'm here. Uh, thank you all once again. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, a welcome to everybody. We are really excited about this opportunity and the chance to have the sharing of different perspectives. And as Siddharth has said, I mean, there is such potential for the use of ICT in potentially creating jobs, but certainly in helping some of the labor markets move more efficiently. And so our interest is not just sort of in the, the developed countries, not just sort of US or Japan or, or Europe, but really emerging markets and the potential in lower income countries in particular. So we're interested in, in taking a more global uh, look at this and what, what really the potential is and what is needed to be able to maximize that. To start off, what would be useful is if each of you could just give a very brief introduction of who you are, the organization or company you work with, and how, how that is addressing some of these issues on trying to make labor markets work more efficiently or working to, to create jobs. Uh, Ali, we're going to start with you. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those of you in other parts of the world. Uh, my name is Ali Basak Russell, and I am I lead international marketing at Odesk. Odesk is the world's largest online workplace, and by that we mean a website where clients from all over the world can connect with freelance talent to do any type of job that can be done in front of the computer. So as long as people all over the world have an internet connection and some basic skills, they have access to jobs through Odesk. And Odesk is a um, software platform that helps clients or, or companies find, manage, and pay freelancers from all over the world. So um, we have uh, a very geographically distributed group of Odeskers, and uh, I can tell you more about that as the conversation progresses, but I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you very much. And Elena? Uh, sorry, Elena, I am not hearing you. Can you just check if your microphone is muted? Oh, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I work in the World Economic Forum, and I'm dealing with the IT industry partnerships and also working uh, on a global project. Uh, it's a global partnership in cybersecurity that brings together 95 organizations. Uh, but also this month, the World Economic Forum released a, a global IT report, 2013 edition, which also focuses on IT. CT and jobs and growth. So from that perspective, it's also very interesting for me to take part in this discussion and to contribute some of the findings. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Fabio. Okay. I 
I just unmuted myself. Uh, good uh, day, everyone. I'm the CEO of a company called Elance uh, that also connects uh, businesses with workers online. Uh, we have uh, about 1.1 million jobs posted on our site every year. About 60% of those jobs gets awarded to uh, online workers uh, in 150 countries. I'm really excited. I love what we're trying to do here. I think it's incredibly important. Um, it has immense potential, and uh, I look forward to contributing and to working with all of you. Great. Thank you very my, much. By the way, my, my entire team wanted to be on this call. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hope they're watching in the Hangout. Even though it's 7 a.m. in California, everybody <laughs> really wanted to be here. So I'm representing a, a very spirited community that is trying to make a difference. Great. Thank you. And Jessica? Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. My name is Jessica Long and I'm a managing director with Accenture and I'm a part of a group called Accenture Development Partnerships which is a not-for-profit group within our company focused solely on international development um, and I think as we can all agree job creation is the number one way right, to move people from poverty to prosperity. And so a big focus of what we do is job creation and, and we truly believe that technology and, and ICTs and everything that the World Bank is discussing today is critical to exactly that, to, to the creation of new jobs, to the s creation of sustainable economies. So very excited to be here today. Great, thank you. And Sean? Oh, sorry, again, not hearing. One more time. Can there you hear go. me now? Yes, and I can hear you now. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Blagsvet, and uh, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Baba Job, and we are an online and mobile uh, portal dedicated to making the informal job market, particularly in India, more efficient. Uh, we've got about 700,000 job seekers on the platform, we've got about 60,000 um, employers, and we're really focused not so much on digital work, unlike e Elance and, and Odesk, but really helping security guards, maids, uh, you know, low-end uh, retail guys, uh, housekeeping staff for companies like McDonald's, um, basically go ahead and staff and find people in digital manners over the mobile, over the phone. Um, I'm excited to think about ways that government and policy um, can help facilitate these things, and in particular, ways that we can unlock much of the data that sort of stuck inside of labor ministries and you know government job exchanges and sort of push that out so that anybody can find from a variety of sources the best job for them, uh, likely on their phone very easily. Thanks. Great, thank you. So Jessica, I wondered if you could just give us a bit of an overview from the work that you are doing and the clients you're interacting with, how they see ICT as playing a role in, in the job creation process. Uh, definitely, and I'm happy to, to take that question. I mean, it, we work with clients across the NGO sector, donors, foundations, governments, and private sector, and I think all of them universally would agree that especially in developing economies or emerging markets, technology is key from a job creation perspective. If I look at the government perspective, um, of course, just bringing broadband, right, bringing connectivity to developing economies has had a, a major influence, has been a tipping point, right, for many of the countries in which we work. So just providing the basic infrastructure that will allow new jobs to come and all of the my fellow panelists that are here today, th their ability, right, to work on these global platforms couldn't happen without that basic infrastructure. So from a government perspective, I th think that's, that's critical. From uh, an NGO perspective, technology has provided not just new ways to bring jobs to developing economies, like technology jobs, it's also just made traditional economies work better. Right, so agriculture, healthcare, education, financial services, anything you can imagine um, in developing economies are just much more efficient and effective because of the introduction of technologies. And then of course from the private sector, technologies is, a, is really allowing these private sector companies to enter new markets that they otherwise wouldn't be able to or, or may have taken years or, and years to enter. And then finally, from a donor perspective, like the, the World Bank and USAID and the UN and others, 
technology, I think, has provided a way for them to scale and replicate some of these great job platforms like the, the other folks on the panel and has provided a, a new way to catalyze job creation that, again, we wouldn't have been able to do just five, ten years ago. Okay, so I had a, a question for, particularly, I guess, for Ali and, and Fabio at this point, uh, and then Sean will come, come back to you. A, a question on the platforms that you are helping create. You know, is this something that is creating jobs or something that is more just helping with matching but not necessarily improving job creation per se? Ali, do you want to answer first? Sure. Yeah, we definitely think that this is creating jobs. Um, we call it lift, not shift. So we're not shifting jobs geographically from where they would originally occur to other places in the world. That's not the goal. Um, we often talk, speak with Odesk businesses who use Odesk that say, if I didn't have um, Odesk contractors or Odesk freelancers, I could not have even created my business in the first place. So many times we see that the, it will there will be an entrepreneur who will create a local business, hire some local people, and then use other people to supplement that core team, or in some cases just use people that, that are geographically distributed as part of their core team. So we think that this is creating jobs. We think that the opportunities, the way that accounting or legal or even data entry or all the different things you can do in front of a computer on ODAS mean that small business owners are able to create businesses and then create more jobs as well. And Fabio? Um, well, a couple of things. First, uh, I completely agree uh, with what Ali just said. Um, we serve a, a vast number of small and medium-sized companies. We have small, medium-sized, and also large companies on e using Elance and hiring on Elance. But the smaller and medium-sized companies could not afford full-time employees in their local geographies or couldn't find them. There is a huge problem which we call surge friction in the labor market, which you know the, the 2010 Nobel Prize winners for, uh, for the economic research uh, really focused on. If you go back to 2010, you'll see that entire paper. And it talks about how labor markets are really imbalanced. Uh, you have, you have um, people that have skills and can't find jobs locally, and then you have lots of businesses who have demand for you and can find you. And technology is, enable, is enabling all of us to bridge that gap. So we find a lot of small and medium-sized companies who, who would love to hire somebody, can't find it, would love to hire somebody, can't just pr pay that price point. Uh, oftentimes, they're looking for fractional help. I think this is one very important concept of fractional help. Fractional work is possible today because technology is reducing the friction uh, for finding that person. If I'm looking for someone for five hours a week or ten hours a week and I'm a small business, I need something very efficient to do that. So we provide that. And then when you look at larger companies, uh, Accenture uh, recently report, you know, reported, um, a stat, published a study on extended workforces. Larger businesses have been spending money on extended workforces and contingent workforces forever. In fact, in the U.S., 90% uh, of companies have contingent workers and spend over $400 billion a year on contingent workforces. Uh, the theory behind this, this white paper is that in order to be highly, highly competitive, these corporations need to have access to the very best person at the very best price at the right time. And again, technology enables that. So it, it's it's... I could totally see the argument now oh, we're moving jobs abroad, we're hiring people in, in lower labor markets. Really don't buy that at all based on what we see. Finally, we all know that when we lift a country uh, out of poverty, we create economic demand for all kinds of goods and services. There is no such thing as a zero-sum game in the economy. So even if you look at it from a very, very macro perspective, um, economic development is good for everybody. And we fundamentally believe that. Okay, so Sean, just picking up a little bit on this question of fractional help, you're helping, as you said, you know, a range of, of workers, not just doing technology-based computer-based uh, computer work, but helping 
uh, match the workers and employers with a range of costs. Are people looking for fractional help or are they looking for more permanent jobs? Most of the folks that we handle are actually looking for full-time work, though this will range anywhere from a few months to several years. There are certainly lots of other people that have done great in the fractional workspace. You know, I can think of TaskRabbit or Zarly that, that are doing lots to basically make that happen. I, I think fundamentally it has to do with market efficiency, that all of us you know, are echoing this part of that we make these markets efficient which means that individuals get to make better, freely uh, made choices about what they want to do with their lives, and, and those businesses do too. And, and you know, if if we believe in markets, we believe that that is a good thing. Um, I, I also think you know it does go back to one thing I always think about is you know Amart Sen when he talks about development is freedom. That if we look at the development as a, of a country, it is not just about its GDP growth but about increasing the freedom that people have, one of the most important freedoms that any of us can have is the freedom to choose a job. And that's the fundamental thing that I think we try to provide, that if you know, somebody's a live-in housemaid at someone's house and may only be making $25 a month, that suddenly they can flip open their phone and find a job that pays them $40 a month, that's still within that neighborhood, that with is perhaps is a better employer, that, that seems to be a, a very fundamental freedom that I view as a normative good in addition to this other piece around, you know, getting markets more efficient, which again is enabling people to, to do what they want to do. Uh, I know that's kind of a long answer, but in short, no, we don't create jobs uh, on Baba Job, but we absolutely do allow people to connect to the ones that are better for them and, and for employers to connect to the employees that are better for them. All right, great. So, uh, Elena, from some of the work that the World Economic Forum has been doing, just uh, one of the things the publication is looking at is the ability of different countries uh, to be able to access ICT, and in some sense, therefore, the potential to use some of the different platforms, either by these particular organizations or ones like them. Could you sort of give a sense of what the trend has been over time, and what the potential, particularly for some of the lower income countries, are on ICT to be able to be part of these broader processes. Oh, sorry, again, it's. Uh, this year's uh, Global IT Report focused on how technology and digitization can impact growth and jobs. And I wanted to cite some, some of the interesting findings which were uh, released in conjunction with the World Economic Forum partners' companies. For instance, a Buzan company calculated and found that in 2011, despite the slowed economic growth, uh, ICT and digitization contributed almost $193 billion to the global economy and created almost 6 million jobs globally. However, the interesting thing is that the impact and the effect in developed markets and developing markets is very uneven. In uh, developed markets, we see that uh, ICT and digitization mostly contributes to the increases in productivity, which sometimes results in the decrease in the number of jobs and job losses. Uh, uh, because low-skilled jobs are replaced with a technology, uh, with a different technologies. However, uh, in developing markets, which are more often focused on exports and, um, and tradable sectors, we see a different effect, which uh, results in increase in employment and jobs. Um, there are a variety of reasons uh, for that, but some of the um, regions that benefit benefited mostly from digitization are Latin America, Asia Pacific, and uh, of course countries like. India. Um, some, some of the reasons for that is that digitization and access um, availability of, for instance, mobile phones in developing countries is sometimes higher or actually often higher than in developed markets. Um, and also the population number in developing markets is greater than in developed markets. So therefore, even a marginal increase in, um, uh, in, in digitization and in um, effects that ICT can have can lead to a uh, generation of a greater number of jobs. So these are some of the preliminary findings. We can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> so Ali, just my question, and then uh, actually would be interested in your answer as well, Fabio. You know, you're working in lots of different countries. Where do you see a lot of 
both sort of where the client's coming from, but from the worker's perspective in terms from that side of the job creation, where, where are the trends? Where are workers really being able to take part uh, on your platforms to access jobs they might otherwise not? Yeah. Well, one of the barriers to entry on a platform like Odesk or, or Elance is internet connectivity. And not just internet connectivity, but you have to have a, at least pretty decent broadband internet in order to be able to not just send files back and forth with your employer, but also use communication mechanisms like Skype. So there has to be some basic internet infrastructure in place in order to make our platforms available to workers in developing countries. Um, that being said, so our top uh, freelancer countries, where um, countries where online workers earned most dollars in last year were India, Philippines, the US actually, Ukraine, Pakistan, Russia, China, Bangladesh, Canada, and Poland. So those are our top ten. That's a, that's a great range of different kinds of countries. Yeah. yeah. Fabio, is this similar kind of thing in Elance, or do you find uh, a different sort of geographic concentration of where your your freelancers or elancers may be living? Yeah. Um, I actually I'm, I had to look it up. Um, <laughs> But a couple of things. First of all, broadband absolutely is an issue. Um, but there's two more that I think uh, are really important to think about in the context of what we're trying to do. One is language. Language is not to be underestimated as an enormous barrier. Um, we find that a large, large number of people that try our system get incredibly intimidated when they have to communicate across other countries and other, uh, and other geographies in English if that's not their first language. So I've always dreamt about a program that creates a universal language. The moment we have universal, universal languages taught in school, everybody's teaching the same language, humanity can be truly connected. Uh, there has to be something um, that the World Bank can do to promote an understanding of the importance of helping people speak universal language. I'm not proposing that's English, even though it is the most obvious one for us. Uh, but I think that we wouldn't even be having this conversation if we couldn't all speak in English. And a lot of the workers that we're connecting are from the get-go at a disadvantage because they can't either speak it or write it. Um, and if you can't speak it or write it, you're confined to very, very low-value jobs. You're, you tend to be confined, at least in our world of knowledge work on a computer, of course. You, you're not going to be able to connect with somebody else in, say, in the United States if you can't communicate in the language very well. And the second piece um, is payment infrastructure. Payment infrastructure is not to be underestimated as a major barrier. Um, we have uh, Africa as a great example, um, but we also have um, other, um, something happened here. Can, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. I think Jessica. Uh, Somebody's taking pictures. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Go ahead. Um, that's good to know. Um, we have. I'll start smiling then. Um, we 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 see people in countries where payments are flowing through, do very well. We see people who are really. Who, for example, the example is the Ukraine. Ukraine has a pretty messed up payment infrastructure, so people are setting up accounts outside of the Ukraine. A uh, classic example is accounts in Israel, and then they find ways to collect in their funds from Israel in some other fashion, or potentially trying to dodge or avoid taxes. Who knows what they're doing? But there is all kinds of issues related to that. In Africa, that's a huge problem. In countries like Pakistan, that's a huge problem. Because even, even if you have a local payment uh, infrastructure for Elance with a bank, the funds take a long time. Consumers go to their banks, they wait and wait and wait. They're not treated properly. We're used to have a certain level of customer service, a certain level of transparency, and they're not getting it. Okay, so I'd like to actually to come back to this question on the financial infrastructure because it does seem to be a, a, an important issue on its own. I just wanted to still uh, sort of keep up on this question, partly on the uh, need for the access for the internet and how sort of sophisticated the technological requirements are. So, Sean, you're working in India. Uh, so obviously there's an incredibly vibrant IT sector, but it sounds like a lot of the people that Baba Jobs is reaching aren't necessarily the ones most active 
uh, with in this sort of more sophisticated space, how do you see the potential for not just these sort of higher requirements? How can you use not quite so sophisticated technology to still access workers? I, I mean, we, we do a lot. Um, so, you know, we make these things work over SMS. We built out IVR systems where people can describe themselves via a set of automated prompts. Um, and then obviously we support, you know, the mobile web and the web as well. Um, the one thing I will say is how well people represent themselves ultimately in a digital context. Like, can they take a picture of themselves? Can they describe themselves? Can they show that they passed an English test? All of these things do help in terms of showcasing that person then to employers. But, you know, I, I think honestly for the vast majority of the bottom two, you know, half of the world economically, it, it is about availability and, and then putting themselves in and showcasing themselves in such a way that they are attractive to employers. Like, you know, we have extremely low-skilled workers that are very happy to get essentially minimum wage jobs in India because they're coming from failed farms. And the availability and access to that job, those really matter. And then once they take that you know, security guard job that's paying $80 a month, they very quickly wise up within six months and realize that they can make 15% more if they work across the street. And so a, a lot of it for me is about uh, the facilitation the government can do to basically say, how do you get everybody into this digital marketplace? And so, you know, I, I actually think the government that's probably doing this best is actually China, uh, where China has done a great job of essentially digitizing lots of factory jobs into central government databases and then making those job feeds available to many, many private companies like Baba Job or the monsters of the world who have then gone and struck deals with handset makers and go basically monetize this whole investment with employers so that everybody has access to this. And so they've played this interesting role of not owning all of the job exchange uh, data directly, but fa definitely facilitating a market where other exchanges then come in on top such that, you know, you know, there's a company, uh, Mobile Job Hunt there, that's very similar to us, that focuses on migrant factory workers. They've got about 50 million users, where you know their average salary is about $150 a month, and, and basically people, this is where they find that next Foxconn job. Um, and so I do think that there's a role that government can play, especially smaller governments, if they want a, a real exchange to come in. You know, lowering the cost of digitization of workers via these sort of standardized formats and facilitation, I think, can help a lot, um, especially in smaller emerging market countries where somebody like Baba Job or Monster may not feel it makes sense to invest there today. Okay. So, Jessica, in terms of some of the different countries that you're involved in, from, say, the government side, uh, do you have many that are sort of coming to you for advice on how to help bring in these kind of platforms? Definitely, and I, I just want to echo some of the things that Sean said. I completely agree about the, the role that government does and can play here in terms of creating or facilitating this open marketplace. And I'll, I think as the World Bank knows, several of these governments that we work with as well, like in Kenya, Nigeria, Indonesia, Tanzania, and others, are really starting to embrace open data. And when you embrace open data, especially government data, you start to set that type of platform that John is talking about where you allow an open exchange of not just ideas and information but an open exchange of jobs right and allow people to start connecting without necessarily putting government or any single entity in the middle right of of that exchange of jobs um, so I think there's some great um, countries out there that are doing exactly this like um, as Sean mentioned China Kenya Nigeria Indonesia Brazil, India, of course, I think there's quite a few good examples. Bangladesh, yes, completely agree, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. um, Rwanda on a smaller scale is, is doing some really interesting things in terms of job exchange and job connection. And I think some of the, the most fascinating ones as well are ones where they're not just looking at job creation and connections within their own country. They're looking at how can we leverage the talent within our country to other countries. Right or between you know countries within the continent. So I think a few great examples out there. Okay. So I, yes. 
May I add a, a, just one more thing on this theme, if I may, um, not to take too much from everybody else, but the theme of education is beyond, it goes beyond English. When Sean was talking about how to present yourself, um, we have so many different cultural differences across the globe and so many different ways of doing business. If, you, if you've walked the streets of India and dealt with any, any commerce person there, you know how different it is from doing business in, say, Norway. And no comparison, and same thing in Lagos. Um, there is a need for helping people understand how to operate in a global market for labor. Again, we focus on knowledge work, which is different than Sean's example. But if you want to help people be really, really successful, if we can create courses for them on how to present themselves, how to, what to expect. The Chinese government has done that exceptionally well. In fact, in China, there are entire organizations that have developed and gone public and become hugely successful corporations on the premise of teaching university graduates how to become white-collar workers. Um, there is a company called Tarina in China that graduate tens of thousands of people post-university degree over for a six-month course on how to become a white-collar worker because they, they didn't grow up with those skills. And I think that uh, any government around the world that wants to play in the global economy should be focusing on that today. So and Mary, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Mary, if I can just comment on some of Fabio's comments, because I, I completely agree. And I, it's interesting. We, we set out, we're developing a few ICT academies across Africa mm -hmm. and Latin America right now. And we, we're doing this in conjunction with NetHope, which is a consortium of, of 38 of the world's largest NGOs. And originally, we started this with the assumption that people needed kind of basic ICT skills, right? And, and maybe some programming skills, testing, that type of maybe, you know, development type of skills. And what surprised me, especially in Africa, is in the last, rolling this out in the last year, we, you know, of course, we went to the countries, talked to the governments, talked to local academies and um, institutions, and in almost all of the countries, they actually emphasize the, the need for soft skills. So not the need for direct, hard programming, testing skills, but the need for things like time management, um, professionalism, program management, conflict resolution, customer service. So all the kind of softer aspects of technology. And um, and in, in talking to a lot of employers, actually, in the last couple of months in Africa and outside of Africa looking for labor, they've all echoed these same things, right? You can find thousands, yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of people with um, certifications, right, technology certifications, but finding that person that can actually implement and finding that person that can deal with a professional environment and work with with coworkers and customers, it tends to be more difficult. That's so I true. think on this education piece, it's it's combining the soft skills and the hard skills. Exactly. So I guess I'd like to pick up on that because it seems to me there's a sort of a more systemic need on education and skills training, some of which may happen in school, some may be in other kinds of academies or training. But I guess from the, if I'm a, a firm looking for workers, I'm going to care about this. How can you as platforms, so I guess this is more for the, those who, of you who are providing these services, how can, how can the, your prospective clients know that the, that the people on your platform have the hard but also have the soft skills? How can you ensure that kind of quality and reliability? I would love to jump in here. Sure. Um, so I was just in Bangladesh a few months ago and um, we were doing what we call a contractor appreciation day. And as part of the curriculum for this Contractor Appreciation Day, we actually had sessions working on just the soft skills that you're talking about. Things as simple as how to market yourself and your profile on ODESK. So in ODESK, each, each freelancer, each contractor, each worker has an online profile, very similar to LinkedIn or some of these other platforms, where um, you have a, a, pic, a photo, you have um, a basic summary of your skills, you have your certifications listed out, you have your feedback scores from other past employers. And so we were just teaching the simplest thing, like make sure that you wear something with a collar in your photo because many of the, the companies that employ on Odesk really like that and that's a sign of professionalism. Make sure you smile in your photograph. 
make sure in your headline that you don't use emoticons. <laughs> um, you know, it sounds so silly, but you know, um, unfortunately, I think some of the West, more Western cultural norms are what's playing out on ODAS, or perhaps fortunately, um, more Western business norms are cultural norms are becoming the norm, and since more Western types of companies are hiring on ODAS, they expect to see certain things. So we do a lot of that. Every time that we go to a country, we just do workshops on how to best market yourself, what to wear, how to smile, like all of those kinds of things. And also time management, also um, just project management. So going through different tools on how uh, technology tools that are t available, platforms like Asana or some, maybe it's just Google Docs, but being really organized and clear on deadlines, it can go so far to just having a, a positive interaction on both sides. Okay. So, Fabio, then can I just take it then the next step further? So, obviously, presenting yourself well is important. Is there ever a problem going too far, right, that people make all kinds of claims on their background and their skills that, in fact, they don't necessarily have? Can, how do you know that people can trust how people are presenting themselves online? Well, that never happens. <laughs> of course uh, not. I wish. So um, we, we attack, the pro it's a complex problem, and we attack it in many ways. Um, obviously, training, uh, we completely agree with the appro one approach is, is mentoring. Uh, we have local, we call them mobilizers in every of our target communities who are trained and basically train others on an ongoing basis. Uh, it's a fantastic program and uh, it's, it's incredibly successful for us. Um, we have a section of Elance called Elance University which uh, will continue to improve and delivers uh, skills both um, you know using online training for both um, Elance skills we call them as well as technical skills. Um, we have um, a system um, based on behavioral science that actually um, that is based on the idea that we can learn what makes a really good worker by studying some of the best managed companies in the world and you'd be pleased to know that we looked at how Accenture does it uh, at one point a couple of years ago. Um, not only Accenture but we also looked at Accenture and we, we basically determined that the five-star rating system that um, is commonly used on, on, on most e-commerce platforms is really irrelevant because it gives feedback after the fact, after a failure, and doesn't really change behaviors and doesn't create the right incentive. It focuses everybody on trying to get five stars, five stars. Who cares about the five stars? What about this, the proposals that you submitted? What about the way you marketed yourself? So we, we have a, we call it the level system. It measures 20 different behaviors on our platform and is the first thing that anybody who signs up on Elance discovers. So we, we, from the very beginning, when you start working on Elance, you learn that there are really three things that matter and three things we want you to think about and three things that are going to make you successful and move up the next level. One is how you market your services. Two is the relationships you build with your client. And three, the service that you deliver. How well do you work, you, the, your actual work? And every one of those dimensions um, drives points that at the end of every week um, determine the level. If you move up a level in our system, you, um, you uh, can give yourself a raise, you will have access to more jobs, um, you will be ranked higher in search results. But to address your, your, your last question, which is about veridicity and, and, and trust on the system, um, we're not the only company that does this. Odesk has exactly the same model. We have hundreds of skills tests. Um, the skills tests have limitations because you can encourage someone to take the test, they will post the test results, but it can be gamed. You could ask your, your cousin to take the test for you, and it's sometimes hard to verify that that person actually is the one that sat down and took the test. But we've added identity verification. We have a fairly sophisticated way to verify your identity. We have a system to verify your credentials so we can actually verify that you graduated from the school or you have that Microsoft certification. Uh, we're doing everything we can. All right, so the question is... It's not perfect. Okay, Sean, so do you agree that the five stars are irrelevant in for Baba Jobs? And I guess the other question, 
uh, for you is if you have less repeat users, if they're looking for a permanent job, how do you establish a reputation um, on your system? I mean, uh, Ed, it's frankly a bit different and it is hard. Um, it also is a matter, as I'm sure these guys can talk about, about willingness to pay. Um, you know, in the informal sector, the, the issues that matter that we find the most are things like, is the job close to me in terms of proximity? Is it the sort of place I actually want to work? Is that status matter? And, and am I really interested in the salary that that's there? Um, and so for most of the kind of, you know, lower skilled jobs, it's a very set of basic questions that you want to get out. And so when we look at most of the reasons that, you know, those things work out or don't work out, they usually have to do with things like, you know, the communication skills weren't at the level people wanted, they weren't really interested in that salary, so they'd stop showing up for work after a week, or, you know, it was too far away from their house. Um, you know, if I look uh, at other services that have done this well, it, it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, in both Elance, Odesk, and TaskRabbit, uh, you know, these are worked very well for people that have invested very heavily inside of that platform and have turned that into the main way that they, you know, make their livelihoods. And, you know, that seems like a, a, a great and scalable way to go. Um, it's not clear to me, and, and they have many transactions, right? That's another part that I think makes what, what you guys do a little different than what we do. As in, oftentimes that we find, you know, if, if I had a bad job in my last thing and I was working as a maid, for example, and my employer accused me of theft, and quit, and I didn't actually steal from anybody. I, uh, people will often just erase that part from their resume when they go into their next job. Um, you know, we do a lot around employer education of encouraging references, of encouraging verification, of encouraging police checks. But frankly, uh, there are different actors in the market. If you're paying minimum wage and you're highly constrained in terms of the prices that you can do, like a security guard or a large-scale housekeeping company, they generally won't pay, essentially, for those additional verification and skills. But if you have an upper-middle-class household, they care deeply about these things, they tend to pay. Um, and so I would say that the challenges are, are different in what we do and a little more fundamental, but a lot of the tools that these guys have been talking about in terms of testing, in terms of greater amounts of verification, you know, those will all get more sophisticated, but, but at this point, if you're only interacting with us via, you know, a, a telephone, um, the, the interactions tend to be lightweight, but a lot of times that's okay, so long as that job is actually near me and at a salary that I have, and I'm willing to do this work of cleaning toilets or this work of, you know, flipping burgers. And that, that, that job is something, I'm again, I'm taking. And so it, it's just some of the things are a little different. At, at the high level, many of the things these guys are talking about come to play. All right, so Anand, welcome uh, to the Hangout. Um, if you just want to introduce um, in terms yourself, just very briefly, and Mobile Works, so uh, everybody else sort of knows where you're coming from. And if you want to sort of jump in on this question of how can you ensure sort of worker quality, reliability, and the, and the dimensions the users of your site are going to care most about. Certainly. So um, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I'll say a few words about MobileWorks. Uh, we are an online crowdsourcing and crowd labor platform uh, that differs in a couple of ways from um, explicitly a, an alternative to Mechanical Turk uh, by Amazon, but uh, our difference is to have an explicit focus on individuals at the bottom of the economic pyramid uh, as a mechanism of uh, carrying out work. Uh, so the majority of our workers come from uh, developing and emerging markets. Um, I think they come from some of the same backgrounds that, uh, the same countries that uh, you see in other online uh, outsourcing platforms with a specific uh, emphasis on individuals who are uh, from low socioeconomic backgrounds, so folks who are um, low earners prior to joining. Um, the question of quality that's being asked is uh, an interesting one because the issues that we're facing are uh, similar to the ones that are faced on the bottom end of e-lancing sites, uh, questions of how you can assess quality effectively, um, especially long dimensions that our customers care about, which are um, to some extent uh, uh, issues that let them stand back and insulate themselves. 
uh, from having to deal with actual interactions with individual workers or testing and screening of individual workers. Um, our approach has historically been to rely on uh, two kinds of tests. Um, uh, and these are, um, again, something that's a little bit different from, um, one is very different from what you'd see on elancing type sites like Odesk and uh, elance, and the other is something that they use uh, very effectively. Um, so the, the first is um, automated testing. Um, we have a large library of automated tests. Um, these are curated and developed on an ongoing basis. Um, but because we have a fairly narrow uh, sector focus, um, we're able to spend a lot of time on making sure that automated testing does a, a fairly good job of, uh, of screening. Um, uh, typically, e-lancing sites cover uh, up sometimes hundreds of tests in different dimensions. Um, we focused on just four or five different areas where we can screen folks very effectively. The other tool that we found works very well is person-to-person -person screening and interviews. Um, especially in areas where we don't necessarily have the necessary cultural expertise in-house to uh, interact with somebody, for example, in foreign language assessments. Um, the combination of these tends to work well for the sectors that we serve and for the customer bases that we serve. Um, I don't know if these kinds of models would scale up um, to cover the entire uh, range of, of tasks and customers that are served by Odesk, Elance, and uh, like. Mary, can I come in here with a with a question for our our group? Uh, and once again, this is uh, really interesting. And thank you all for these fantastic uh, ideas that you're sharing. Um, in fact, picking up Anand from the the point you just made about scale, um, and and Fabio, you made this uh, excellent point about language, and this is something we've been talking about as well. Um, Certainly, one of the things that you've very correctly pointed out is that the conversation we're having here as well is in English. And, and what I, I'm very curious about from the platforms that we have here is uh, your experience and, and the, uh, the ideas that you've seen around the world for alternative language uh, platforms. Uh, so for example, we have a, you know, the Russian equivalent of Facebook. Do we have a Russian equivalent of uh, websites like Odesk or uh, Elance? Uh, similarly, uh, Sean, your your work with Baba Jobs, have you seen similar models in other countries, Anand, for you as well? And and in that regard, one of the questions that we have been thinking about quite a bit is uh, the scale. Um, you know, we're still talking about 600 million jobs that we're going to need in the world over the next decade, um, and and the numbers that we're still speaking of here are in the low millions, uh, which is great, of course. But how do we really get to a hundred million or a two hundred million number? What do we need to do to make that happen? And obviously, language would be one of them. So, uh, bundling those two questions together, I'm very curious to hear your views and ideas, and and maybe uh, examples that you have from around the world of alternative language websites and multilingualism in the online world. Thank you. Um, I'll be very brief. Yes, there are. Um, examples of platforms similar to what Elance and Odesk and, and others do in local languages. There's several, three or four in Latin America alone. Every one of the Latin American platforms is struggling because um, the demand side in, in Spanish language, Spanish languages or Brazilian, Portuguese, isn't as strong, number one. Even though there's plenty of supply, there's not enough demand. And, and second, the payment infrastructure in those countries is completely messed up. You try to get money out of Argentina or Brazil, forget it. It's impossible. That forces um, these, uh, these platforms to operate locally. I do think that there is a, a, there's a local play in almost any country in the world, and then there is a global play. Um, Elance is focused uh, today on global, country to country, and enabling ge you know, frictionless cross geography, whether it's in the United States or the United States and Canada or around the world. But there is a need for local solutions as well, no question. Um, second, I personally fundamentally believe that removing friction from the labor market and eliminate, eliminating the divides that exist, the cultural divide, the language divide, the, the knowledge divide, the payment infrastructure divide. Every time you eliminate divides, uh, you the broadband divide, 
you create opportunities that turn into productivity and turn into more work for everybody. So if I, have to, if I had to point to single number one thing that the World Bank could do is identify the five or six biggest levers in, hu in human history and promote the heck out of those because those will translate into jobs. And there's one more, which is the trust divide. Commerce doesn't happen without trust. And fundamentally, this model of online work is about trust. And in fact, if I may add, I'm sorry, this is, I have so much passion in this. In Nigeria, uh, let's take a look at Nigeria. What is the single biggest problem that Nigeria has today to exploit um, the online opportunity and what ICT is trying to do? Unfortunately, the single biggest problem that Nigeria has, and, and we love, by the way, what we're trying to do there. You know that we're, a number of us uh, here participated in the event that you've organized. And all of us, I think, have, have members of the community active there. We know how smart and capable the university students and the young people in Nigeria are. And yet the reputation of Nigeria is a disaster outside of, of, outside of their own country. And the governments have to understand that the reputation of their workers on a global scale is fundamental. So trust matters a lot. And there's almost a branding element. You want to create a brand. Just like the Philippines have this brand for being extraordinarily good workers, how can we create the same thing around the world and help governments understand how important that is? Thank you. And Ali, do you want to jump in here? I'm sure you have some thoughts on this. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm actually in Germany right now, and I know that there is a much, much smaller platform than ODAS or Elance called Twago that is specifically focused on um, local matching of companies and freelancers. And um, I think to Fabio's point, there's no, we are trying to be global as well. We are global. Um, a lot of our transactions occur across borders and we think that's a good thing, bringing people together from around the world. And, um, but there's no reason why Odesk can't be used locally too. So if a German company wants to hire a German contractor, if a Ukrainian company wants to hire a Ukrainian freelancer, that can happen as well on our platform. So um, one other issue I wanted to bring up is the idea of urban crowding and the degree to which um, ICT jobs are focused in urban centers. I don't know if we want to push that off to a later topic, but I was I was definitely interested in Sean's take on that and how um, if his platform is primarily operating in urban centers or if there are opportunities in more rural areas as well. I guess I, I can take that. Um, I mean, at a fundamental level, uh, you know, salaries are higher in urban centers in India. Um, and so there's definitely been a push to make, say, you know, BPO jobs, the sort of jobs that can be done via information work, to get those, um, you know, to basically encourage those in a more rural setting. Um, but, but there's a reason people move to cities, there's a reason people immigrate, and it's always for economic opportunity. And so, um, and I do think, you know, that is the choice of an individual, right? Like, if you look at most people that have moved, like there's been 100 million people that have moved into the Indian cities in the last decade, and they do that because they can send money home, and, and many of those agricultural jobs are, are, are failing. Um, and so, yes, like we, we provide primarily urban jobs, but we do do the stuff. I mean, there's been a lot of activity in virtually every small urban city happening throughout India, but, um, you know, at a very basic level, cities are where the money is. And so people will go to that in, in search of those better opportunities. Um, to this point about local languages, absolutely. Right? I, I think to, to, to Fabio and your point of if you're working for the global market, there's a lingua franca. It looks like that's going to be English, and that's how people present themselves really matter. And, and those standards, I think, are, are coming in. Maybe China will have the muscle to, to kind of change that, but uh, I, I'm skeptical. I think, though, for most people, though, even in 20 years, I think they're going to be working in their local communities. And in their local communities, you're going to have local languages. 
And thus, you know, there's always going to be an opportunity for local players, be it job exchanges or any other type of thing, to make interfaces in local languages. You know, our mobile site is in five different Indian languages. We're adding more all the time. If you look at the Chinese job uh, guys, they're all in you know Chinese, um, and so that will happen. I also think there is a push to say uh, you can make these things work in local languages over voice itself, right? If you look at one of the biggest search companies in India, it's a company called Justile, and what they do is they basically put a call center in front of Google, and so somebody talks to a real person in a local language who then does a lookup on the intranet and then gets texted back information. And so I think these kind of hybrid models that definitely reach out to everybody in languages that everyone understands are happening. And I think for any local exchanges where both the employer and the job seeker are going to speak of that local language in their normal everyday interaction, well then it, of course it makes sense that the tools they use to find each other are also in that language. And so you'll see that. Okay, so Jessica, you wanted to comment on this as well? Yeah, just a couple of comments both on, on what John and, and Ali were saying and questioning regarding um, urban and, and cities. So we've, we have been looking within Accenture and actually doing um, a lot of work in the, in the rural space or the rural outsourcing space in particular. Um, everything from, you know, in North America we've, we've helped set up um, outsourcing centers on Native American reservations, right? So in the U.S. and in Canada, and we have a couple in, in rural India. The big challenge, as you can imagine, is we're talking about technology, right? So having the basic infrastructure even to have this type of chat, right? And I'm in D.C. today and my Google kept shutting down, right? So just having basic infrastructure um, is critical and customer service is key, right, when we're talking about technology type of work, whether it's call center work, you know, development work, testing, medical records, whatever it is. Uh, so, so the rural, I, I think rural will get there. Um, I think the piece we shouldn't forget about are tier two, tier three cities, right? So it doesn't have to be in the major capital, um, you know, the big metropolis in, in these countries. It's, it's really about how do we start now looking at the tier two, tier three, cities in some of these countries that are becoming, you know, their own little mini hubs and we could start to move jobs outwards. The other thing that I think is really interesting when it comes to technology is bringing work to people as opposed to people to work, right? So looking at more ways in which people can actually work from home, right? Uh, so for example, I'm at home right now doing this chat and you know we're working in in a, in a country in the Middle East trying to find ways to help women who wouldn't be able to join the traditional workforce do their do work via technology from home, right? So as as Ali brought up this question on urban, I think technology brings an interesting opportunity to bring jobs out to people. Um, there are big challenges, and when I think of the role of the World Bank, I think it's about again that infrastructure, right? So how do we bring the infrastructure out to the more rural areas? and to the tier two, tier three cities. So Elena, just a question. So the World Economic Forum, when it's measuring uh, both in some sense the competitiveness but also the sort of IT infrastructure, do you have any information that can differentiate um, urban versus rural areas in these countries? So the Network Readiness Index and the ranking of countries is based on basically two approaches. First, the index measures the availability of infrastructure, and second, it measures the um, uptake of this infrastructure. But also a major component of this index is executive opinion survey. So basically local partners in each country, they go out to business leaders and with a question where they ask people how they see the technological development, how they see the competitiveness of their own economy, and then this data is processed and half of the index and ranking of the country is composed uh, based on the executive um, opinion surveys. And actually it was also interesting, um, I wanted to comment on the point raised by uh, Jessica. Yesterday there was um, a quite a big conference by New York Times uh, which talked about the urban development and they were talking about the same um, issue as uh, cities develop and uh, as in urban infrastructure progress then then actually work follows people and not people follow work because uh, employers want to create more jobs in the areas where young people progressively minded are concentrated so basically these are also uh, this can also be attributed not only to development of ICT but a more broader urban infra infrastructure so I just I want to take up this question of scale and the sort of the how big is the upside potential for a lot of these kinds of ways I mean 
the various things that you're involved in is a mixture of bringing people to work, but also bringing work to people. They can do it for those who have access to the broadband and the computers. It is bringing work in some sense to them. But I guess one of, one of the other questions sort of Sean says that people like to work in their communities, and obviously Baba Jobs has a bit more of this sense of uh, trying to find people who are looking for a longer commitment on a job. But for those who are providing more of the online platform, are workers looking for this as part-time work? Are they just wanting to have this sort of fractional, compartmentalized work? Or are they using this really hoping that they can find a longer match? Is this what they want as their job? Or do they see this as a stepping stone to present themselves to a wider set of people who might employ them permanently? So can I, can I comment on this one? So I mean, one of the things that uh, is obvious when you think about it, but I think it is worth unpeeling, is especially for informal sector workers, and I think for everyone broadly, work is a form of identity and status, right? And so if you look at, for us, what is it, especially with youth, right, especially pre-marriage, what is the primary point of work? It's money, but it's also the story that your social circles, particularly in India, your parents, get to tell about you to other potential mates, right? And so we find interesting things like, you know, somebody will take a lower paying job at a branded company like the Reebok outlet than they will then say work in someone's home because their marriage ability and their status in that changes drastically depending on whether they're working in somebody's home or they're, um, you know, working in a branded company like Reebok. And so we face this as a startup, and I'd be curious to hear from Elance and Odesk, that because many technology things are so new, they almost don't have the cultural cachet, which in India is so important at a pre-marriage age, that I don't even know how a, you know, an, an elderly parent would describe their son if they work full-time at, El at Elance to that parent's friends. And these factors matter tremendously in terms of the choices that especially the youth then goes ahead and, and chooses. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. I have a, if, if, a story, but it's a story that there's, there's hundreds of those. Um, during a recent trip, I met a very successful e-lancer who had built, as many of the best ones do, an entire business. So there's this concept of moving from business of one to business of many where you create a whole company on the system, not unlike a power seller on eBay, frankly, where you, you, you start with small and you, you scale. And he told us the story that Sean talked about, about his parents. He was a very good engineer at Siemens, which is a huge reputation in India, Was had a well-paid job. And one weekend, he got on Elance, and in one weekend, he made more than he makes at Siemens in one month. And he was blown away. And then he did the same thing the following weekend and he finally went to his parents and said that's it I'm quitting my job at Siemens and all the parents care about is the brand and they were freaked out um, and he did it anyway and he started his own little company and now he has over 200 employees and he drives a Mercedes and he's a little uh, a little flashy I have to admit flashier than my taste but he clearly has um, gone through the parent thing and the stigma and, and it's real, it's real. It, it absolutely is real. I do think that there's multiple tiers of work on our platforms. Many of the people on our platforms are actually working for a local employer. So even though they are uh, from, the re from, from the outside looking in, they're freelancers, in reality they belong to a team. Uh, there is someone who set them up, who set up an environment, so they are going to work in a real office. Um, and especially in developing countries. Somebody has had the um, in entrepreneurship to, to start and make enough money and has the marketing skills uh, and the financial skills to set up a company and then little by little they hire their friends from college and, and whatever else and they build the whole company. Yeah, if I could jump in here too. I think it does depend um, on the country too. Obviously in India you know, it's a different culture than the Philippines where there isn't as much taboo or um, cultural pressure against being a freelance worker. Um, in fact, in the Philippines, people, it's become very popular and uh, 
a very, I think it has become almost to the point of being just as good as a desk job at one of the call centers or one of the larger companies. So I think it's definitely country by country. Agreed. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, oh, one of the things, one of the reasons why I came to work at Odesk is because I feel like um, the stories we hear for people who want to work at home, whether because they're handicapped or working moms or just part of a larger family unit where they need to be close to um, ailing parents or they just love to work from the small town in which they grew up um, and they don't want to move to a big city and the freedom that that brings, um, that working on ODES can bring, I mean those are the stories that really sold it for me and, and touched my heart and made me want to work at ODES. So I think to your earlier question, you know, do some people see this as a lifestyle, as a long-term employment opportunity, or do people just kind of do this a little bit to supplement their income or only until they can find um, a better opportunity? But I, I, we see it across the board. We have clients who have employed people for seven years on Odesk as Odesk freelancers, and they've chosen to be freelancers because they have just so much more freedom, and that's the, the lifestyle. It, it's a lifestyle choice for them. So I think... It really depends. Um, it's a case by case basis, both by country and by individual story. Anand, do you want to jump in? Sure. So, I mean, I, I can echo some of the same points that were made here by uh, the other. Um, we've certainly seen this kind of transition happen um, where individuals enter. Um, perhaps at the, the lower end of the scale, um, work for some time, develop a cadre of skills, and then eventually graduate up. Um, I think that one of the differences in the approach that we've taken is that um, we explicitly look at uh, the kind of online work we provide as a stepping stone to transition individuals into the broader microwork uh, economy um, and into the, the broader um, online economy um, where individuals might start uh, doing very low-end work and low-skilled work, um, things involving uh, data entry or online research or various forms of uh, semi-skilled semi or semi-unskilled activities, and then eventually, after developing enough expertise and capabilities, graduating out and uh, finding work, uh, perhaps on a, a complementary platform like Odesk or Elance, um, that might uh, give them a... Um, a more long-term means of, uh, of a career trajectory. Um, or in some cases, we have seen people graduate out into the traditional economy, which is also great for, from our point of view. Um, they've been able to build up a profile and an online resume that means that uh, they can uh, find work that is um, local as opposed to continuing to work in our, in our ecosystem. And we view that as a positive outcome from our point of view as well. Right. So you, you sort of see uh, graduation as a sign of success, I guess, whether that's sort of shared more widely or is there retention of some of the best workers a challenge? You know, how, how can you keep your platforms um, as something where you will retain some of the, the best workers? And I guess another question is, so obviously what they can get paid matters, the flexibility and et cetera can matter. Uh, but the other might be sort of benefits. Um, this kind of work, particularly if it's much more sort of piecemeal, do these workers have any opportunities to be able to access any other kind of uh, security or benefits um, that might come along with a permanent job? And how, how can you address those uh, needs on the, on the parts of the workers? It, it really depends on where they're based. Um, if they're working for a local employer, they have whatever benefits the local employer offers. If they're in some, in some economies where there is um, public health benefits available, like Sweden or the UK, of course, they have whatever is available to them. Um, possibly the biggest challenge uh, for us in terms of benefits are is, is US-based workers, actually. And um, we've, we spend a lot of time studying the problem We've done two things. Uh, we have a partnership uh, with a company called eHealth that allows us to 
propose plans to to independent contractors on our system who choose to self-insure. Um, we also have a set up a separate company, the Elon's Talent Group, that hires uh, people as employees of the Elon's Talent Group if they qualify, and allows us to payroll them and provide them with 401k benefits and health insurance. Um, they will then in continue to operate as freelancers. They will continue to m work for multiple clients, four hours here, ten hours there, throughout the week as they choose. Or they may work for only one company, but they, they have the benefit of that backing. Um, however, the vast majority of the people in our market in the U.S. Um, on Elans are uh, mostly 1099s in true independent contractors, even though we have this option. Uh, and they are aware of it, they still prefer to be 1099. Outside of the U.S., it really depends on a country-by-country -country basis. I don't know what Ali has seen or Sean or Anna, I'd be curious to hear your points of view. It's very similar for us. Um, I think you pretty much covered it. There's obviously challenges, and one of the greatest challenges in the U.S., too, is that a lot of times it's not a 40-hour work week, it's a, it's a part-time flexible employment. So. Um, uh, one other question I wanted to raise to the group is Odesk is wonderful. I think it's providing meaningful work opportunities for people that have even low-level skills. But I was wondering if the paper will, or this working group, will at all focus on what can be done through ICT for the poorest of the poor, people who need skill development before they can access work opportunities through the Internet. Yeah, let me actually uh, quickly respond to that. Uh, and thank you for asking that question. In fact, this has been one of the uh, questions we have had, and uh, the reason also we're uh, having this conversation with this group. Um, whether Baba Job and the informal work economy, uh, or Anand, the kind of work you're doing, uh, where you're really talking about people at the lower end of the skills range, maybe lower end of the access to ICT range, which just basic mobile phones, for example. Uh, and also the kind of work uh, that Accenture's uh, programs have been doing in impact sourcing, where, uh, and, and, just, and, and all three of you probably can, can come in on this, because I'm very curious as well to hear about your thoughts of how we can truly involve and include the poorest of the poor, the least skilled, the least accessed communities and individuals in the world, and include them in the world of work. And maybe just before I hand it back to the participants here, uh, one certainly one of the themes that we have in, in the section where we're going to talk about uh, how ICT is going to empower uh, workers, or is empowering workers already, is to think about how labor markets are becoming more inclusive. And we've already heard a little bit about that, about uh, women in countries where they aren't able to work in the regular workforce uh, being included through ICT, about people with disabilities having access to employment. I think these are all wonderful stories. Uh, and I, you know, I would love to hear more. So I'm going to hand it back. And, and, and I'm just going to mention Anand, uh, Jessica, and Sean, because you uh, are more explicitly working in that area. But of course, I'm, I'm very keen to hear from all of you on this. So maybe, uh, Jessica, over to you. Sure. Um, well, a couple things that I, I'd love to, to mention or two, two big things. One is around this whole area of impact sourcing or inclusive workforces that you're mentioning. It, it's definitely something we're very involved with, both in terms of like the example I gave around rural India or um, Native American reservations. We're also doing work to, that we call inclusive outsourcing which is bringing in people from very disadvantaged populations, whether it's um, slums or you know people with physical or, or other disabilities, or just other people that don't have traditional access to workforces. And it does take a, a different form of training, um, a different form of recruitment, very similar to what this group mentioned, just um, a little bit more intensive maybe than your traditional workforce. I, I think it is, it's a model that we should all continue to pursue, both from a small business as well as a, a large business perspective. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunities and, again, a big role that the World Bank and governments can play in this. The, other, the second big area I wanted to mention is I, I know we're 
it feels like we're focusing very heavily in this conversation on pure technology jobs, right? So outsourcing and development and coding and, and things that are just purely work that you do in front of a computer. I think the other thing that might be interesting for the bank to explore in this paper is, is how ICT is enabling other sectors, right? So especially when we talk about the base of the pyramid, you can't really ignore agriculture culture, right, and manufacturing and healthcare as, as major sectors in the developing world. And technology has enabled or will enable, I think, huge job creation in those sectors. So if, especially things like agriculture and manufacturing, right, how can we use technology to bring more people from the base of the pyramid into those sectors and in a much more effective and efficient way. And then a lot of those other issues that we've talked about today, like infrastructure and language, soft skills may not be as big of a barrier when we talk about those other sectors. So just a, a couple of comments to throw out there. I mean, one thing I'll add in, if you guys can hear me, is I think you have to start with an accurate definition of poverty. How do people go into it? How do people get out of it? Um, and it's one thing that I often think is a, there's a whole discipline. The World Bank has funded a bunch of that. We were inspired by research from a fellow that was looking at this, and he says, you know, if you want the sort of short answers of people go into poverty due to healthcare-related debt, and so if you want to stop poverty in all the most industrial-related countries, you, you come up with insurance schemes that actually, in the event that somebody can no longer work or needs catastrophic care, that there's some safety net that comes in there. If you look at the reasons that people get out, right, and there's, this is the research that really inspired our company, it was about job diversification. But it wasn't a slow. It, w it wasn't an instant process. And so this is one other thing of, you know, this is a multi-year process to have somebody go ahead and raise income. We have job seekers on Baba Job that have changed jobs five times, six times over the course of you know the last three years. And with each one of those job changes, they're earning another twenty percent. And so they may have been at minimum wage at the beginning, but suddenly you know they've got a job working, say, as like the like, for example, there's a fellow in my office, right? He was started out as our driver, um, you know, had found out of us, and he's sort of worked into like a customer service executive after a period of six years, and makes three or four times what he did uh, three years earlier. And you know, you find that that the story of how people get out is often one of change, of taking advantage of opportunities, of learning certain skills on the job. That sometimes, yes, they go to a school for three months. And learn a set of skills, but that's not the end, right? That it's this continual process of seeing opportunity, either expanding in the current organization or leaving that organization and taking a job somewhere else. Um, you know, we find that when people switch jobs on Baba Job, they're usually doing it because they can make about 20.1% more money based on that switch. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on vocational training and schools in India, and I, I'm a big fan of those things, but that's just one stopgap measure. That's just one piece of education on your path of work that is going to take a decade. And so I think you have to take somewhat of a holistic approach to that and say, hey, we can train somebody for three months to do cell phone repair. But then all of these soft skills of how they're going to hustle for a better job, of how they're going to turn this into a business, so all of those other things come into play. Um, and I think one very basic thing that I don't think we focus on enough is just story exchange. How do I hear about somebody else that looks like me, that was from my community, and how did he make it out? What was it that he did, right, or she did, and what were the strategies that worked for them? And, and you know, we've seen this in agriculture working pretty well with things like digital green, uh, and that's another place where I think just spreading those stories of how people make it, and what are successful strategies, via ICT, via video is one very basic thing that I think could help a lot. One great stat that I just wanted to jump in with quickly, Sean, I, I, to I totally think you may bring up a great point that once you're into these jobs, you learn so much on the job and your upper mobility is really there. But I think that first barrier to get into these types of jobs is, is the toughest part. Um, but to your point, on ODESC, ODESC freelancers on average, grow their earnings 190% over three years. So once you got onto the ODES platform and you have some basic level of success, your, your upward trajectory is, is amazing. Um, so yeah, I would, I would like to hear more about how we get more people participating in these programs from the get-go or 
or just take a chance, and, or, or maybe it starts with awareness. I can speak a little bit to this because this is an issue that we have dealt with a number of times in trying to identify ways to bring bottom of the pyramid populations out um, into uh, online work systems. Um, and I think Sean made some excellent points that really the that it's important to start with the core understanding of the causes of poverty and and uh, who is is truly who is truly poor and going to benefit from the kinds of opportunities that we're offering. Uh, what we have found is that um, it is difficult uh, to take uh, um, online work and apply it as a panacea for some of the uh, existing uh, external causes of poverty. Uh, we can help in a very particular way through job creation, opportunity creation, skills development, um, and highlighting opportunities. Um, but there are individuals who we have tried to reach who we can't reach um, because they are uh, too poor to operate a cell phone. Uh, they don't understand um, basics of, of uh, how to um, how to send uh, how, how to operate a technical interface. They lack the inter the, the technical literacy to engage um, with the online world. And as as much as um, our organizations uh, should try and reduce the barriers to entry there, um, there are problems that uh, we certainly uh, can't address by ourselves. Um, so the model that we followed to try and make this work is to partner with organizations that actually do focus on those kinds of skills training and cultivation as their main mechanisms for, as, as their main purpose. Um, our expertise is in getting, getting the work, finding the, the companies that are willing to provide it, making it available to the workforce, uh, but it's nonprofit partners on the ground that have, have really been able to expand our reach downward uh, to try and reach populations who are underserved. So this addresses a question from um, one of the listeners, Maria Lorena um, Madrid um, you know, we've done this in the United States um, and, and worked with um, low-income and, and impoverished individuals in New York City. Um, you know, these are people who maybe had low technology familiarity or low literacy with computers prior to entry, um, and we didn't go and teach them how to use computers, but uh, we worked with a network of nonprofits in the city who did. Um, and this is a way that might be a workable model going forward for our platforms, is not to try and do the entire uh, mood of, of finding really, really low, uh, um, low earning individuals, but perhaps working with groups who already have access to these individuals um, and uh, providing a complementary service. Anon, can you speak to any of those nonprofits that have been particularly successful? This is something I'm really passionate about, so I'd love to hear who you think is, is doing great work out there. Sure. I mean, there's a number of participants all, all throughout. Um, and you find these more in, um, in uh, emerging economies as opposed to um, within the U.S. Um, our partners in New York City are all partners that are, um, this, is, this was facilitated by the government of New York. Um, and so these nonprofits are typically employment focused into, uh, organizations. And then in places like India, um, we've worked with various groups that are doing um, uh, information uh, technology. Uh, they're, they're looking at rural outsourcing um, as their main mechanism. So for example, Rural Shores is a good example of a, of a company that's out there that is doing work in this area. Um, and these kinds of entities are, are quite numerous. Um, may I may I add a, a, just one comment? Um, I don't know enough about uh, agriculture manufacturing development, um, but um, I do believe that there is something about the theme of inspiration. I completely agree with comments made earlier by by many of you. When someone sees a person just like them being successful, um, it is incredibly effective. And I believe that people that um, have been successful should become champions and examples for people in their villages, people in their community. So how do you discover the winners and then ask them to come back and talk to others about how they did it? We, we, you, we did exactly that in, in, all together in, in Lagos uh, a few weeks ago. It was amazingly powerful. There were people driving four hours five hours into Lagos to talk about what they did um, and, and how it impacted their village. 
and the impact that it had on their community. Um, so inspiration is a big thing. And the other piece that we think is, is extremely interesting is connecting university and, and um, vocational training with access to jobs. There's a huge disconnect today. Even in this country, a lot of people are graduating with degrees that don't deliver any jobs. And that is the, like the, the, the worst nightmare. Um, you, you raise your children, you send them to university, you send them to a community college, send them to a technical school, and they don't land the job. Huge problem. Huge, huge issue. So I don't think we can solve every single problem, but if we could only provide access to work to the people that have worked very hard to get there, um, to the people that have developed the skill sets, uh, those people in turn can take care of their own. I, I am a huge believer that if we create a class of empowered and educated uh, individuals in some of these developing countries, they will take care, they will do their best to take care of their own. We need to really start there. It is a crime in so if for humanity to have uh, entire countries with 30, 40, 50 percent university graduates with no work. Unbelievable. How can we fix that? And I, I think. Uh, Fa Fabio, yeah, uh, just on that note, because uh, just to go, go back to a question someone's posed, uh, what do you think maybe that local governments could do uh, to, to get, and this goes back to the point you made about reputation, uh, what do you think could uh, be done to strengthen reputation systems and trust systems? And of course, uh, Fabio, after you, if anyone else wants to weigh in on that. Well, um, I... I you know, we used an example earlier. Um, the it's a challenge because a, the the values and ways of doing business have to be shared across an entire society. If you have a government who doesn't necessarily operate in a certain way, in an ethical way, in a transparent way, it's very hard for those very politicians to then stand up and say, "We're going to promote programs for integrity, trust." And and, and reputation. It's hard to do, I recognize that, but I do believe that there's plenty of people with exceptionally good intentions and tremendous integrity. Um, they need to recognize and create a movement around the importance of representing their, their country, um, their reputation on the global scale, how critical it is to the success of foreign investment, to the success of exporting their services. Um, I think it's mainly marketing, um, but I know that it's a really big problem. It's a, I do believe it's a marketing. If you don't start to talk about it, that's why I'm being vocal about it. If you don't talk about it and acknowledge that it's an issue, no one's going to do anything about it. When we were in Lagos, we actually explicitly brought the topic up to the community in the room, and a lot of people acknowledged that they themselves can help monitor uh, each other and help identify people that are abusing the system, because anybody that abuses a global system hurts everybody else on it. Yeah. Um, and in fact, maybe, uh, Elena, I think you, you, you wanted to weigh in on a couple of points as well here. Right. I wanted to comment on the question raised by Jessica earlier in terms of how ICT and digitization impacts uh, different uh, sectors. And this is something also that uh, GITR 2013 touched upon a little bit and provided initial thoughts. So basically what we found is that if a uh, sector is focused on an expansion into new markets, then the sector and then ICT actually helps create more jobs for this sector. But if a sector is focused more on increase, uh, increases in outputs and productivity, then this sector uh, cuts more jobs w when uh, more ICTs are employed. And basically the example of this is uh, the financial services. So they cut the most number of jobs uh, when employing new technologies, but also gain the most outputs uh, through ICTs. And the se services sectors that benefit most in terms of creating new jobs when they uh, employ new technologies are uh, hospitality sector and uh, uh, e-commerce sectors. So I'll add one crazy thought that I'm kind of curious to hear what people think, which is I'll posit that countries that invest actually a lot in getting people to use Facebook probably are going to be better off in the end. And, and that, that basically the Facebook part has two things that I view as beneficial in terms of this wider conversation. One, that by essentially investing, for, at least for the youth, for two to three years in making a Facebook profile, 
suddenly if they have those skills, I imagine they could do most of the digital work from at least at the low end of the three companies that are here. And the second thing is Facebook actually comes a little bit closer in terms of beginning to teach people about online reputation and, and verification of identity and basically saying that you are who you say you are. And so I, I know this may sound odd, but, um, you know, I, I actually think there's there, there, it would be interesting to see the paper to see what is the economic and verification and trust benefits of Facebook going forward, both as a learning platform and as a verification platform in the next 10 years. That's a great point, Sean, and uh, I, I wish we had Facebook on this conversation as well, because I'm sure they would be happy to hear that. Uh, I mean, they're just <laughs> one of many social networking platforms. There may be others that supplant them, but this whole of idea of a social networking platform that has trust, that has an online profile built into it, and is fairly ubiquitous, is, I think, useful in terms of teaching many of the skills and, and trust things that we need in the coming decade. And, and this also speaks to a lot of the other social media platforms. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of, for example, in the US, Angie's List, which has uh, become this big thing where uh, reporting about the quality of uh, the work of contractors, doctors, uh, you know, uh, daycare workers, whatever, uh, has become really a, a means to verify the quality and, and the capacity of certain individuals. So your, your point is well taken, and I think that what it really speaks to, uh, and the point that maybe uh, going back to what Fabio was saying as well, um, in terms of really encouraging people with the right intentions to, to be part of this positive movement and participate in a way that projects this community in a positive light, uh, whether it's through the social media or it's through other means, I think certainly something we would like to explore, and I'm happy to have this conversation offline with you as well. Great. I, I am unfortunately mindful of the time. This has been a fabulous discussion and really have appreciated very much the contribution everybody has made to this. But I'm just going to sort of take uh, Sean's phrase of crazy ideas. So what I'd like to encourage each of you is to think sort of what kind of crazy, not necessarily super crazy idea you have uh, to really bring some of these things up to scale. Right? So we've talked about different kinds of things, different potential to really help ICT on making labor markets work more efficiently, to empower more workers, and ultimately to help with job creation itself. But would love to hear your sort of bottom line takeaway, sort of, you know, if you're really going to push what sort of a crazy idea or important idea uh, that really needs to be on the conversation to make that a reality. So Sean, you're on screen for me, so I'm going to let you go first. Okay. <laughs> Any other crazy so ideas? I, I put this in this paper, but I, but I really think in terms of a government piece, the more that digital formats can be, one, defined and encouraged, especially for informal sector labor, so that you know, the maid with some amount of skills or a recent graduate from a school that may be vocational has a way to digitize that format that they can be uploaded to many other sources is important. And then to encourage more government labor ministries and schools to basically use that format, it seems like it could catalyze a much larger digital market in terms of access to jobs. Um, so that would be my vote. Great. Elena? Uh, so I think uh, actually promoting awareness and uh, uh, about the effects that positive effects that ICT can have on technology uh, that ICT can have on economic growth is very effective. So by now we see that almost over 100 uh, countries have uh, sophisticated uh, even national ICT and broadband strategies. So I think actually uh, just giving uh, and promoting the, the positive effects that ICT can have among government and policymakers. So that's one of the most effective uh, ways to move forward in terms of uh, scaling up the effects. Great. Anand, do you want to go next? Absolutely. So I think that one, one uh, crazy idea that might be interesting is to try and improve uh, the portability and exchange of, uh, of uh, the collection, we'll say the collection of uh, information about online work opportunities uh, between all the major providers that are out there um, and trying to uh, tailor this information's availability for people who are at the bottom of the pyramid would be terrific. Right now, uh, we have a lot of great services out there on the web, um, but we're each sort of uh, walled, walled, walled silos right now. Um, and uh, I think one thing that government and World Bank can do especially 
is uh, lead the way in uh, trying to um, improve awareness by maybe collecting information about jobs from all these platforms and structuring them in a in a, a single a single point of access or a single way. Great, um, Ali. Uh, so I totally agree with what Anand just said. I think also kind of piggyback on that point. I'm a huge believer in the power of storytelling, and so I think if we can feature some freelancers have this this type of work opportunity has been transformational. I think it will really break down some of the stigma that we were talking about um, on freelancing in certain countries. And then the other thing that's just more of a government relations um, point that we can work on through this paper is perhaps just thinking about tax incentives and um, how we can make it easy for for freelancers to do well um, on platforms like Odesk and, and uh, others. So I think tax implications, that, those kinds of things are all issues that regulatory com components could be addressed as well. All right, Savio? If uh, we're talking about wild ideas, um, I, I envision every graduate of every school um, in developing countries having access to a loan and an entrepreneurship package from the World Bank that get, pays for their broadband access, pays for a computer, and gives them uh, training on uh, online work skills and micro-entrepreneurship skills, provided that um, they agree to go through this training course. The training course could be taught by other successful online workers or elancers and uh, provided that they go through the program, they get access to this and you know, then the financing of it, whether they can pay it back within a few months or it's paid for by their government, it doesn't really matter, but that would be fantastic. It would make an enormous difference, at least in the area of knowledge work. Great, and then Jessica? Um, so a couple things, and then adding on to what Fabio said, I, I guess, Two, two big things I think we need to tackle if we're really going to get beyond these really successful pilots, you know, that maybe hundreds or thousands of people are working to get to that point of millions, tens, hundreds of millions of, of job creation. I think there's at least two different angles we have to approach. One is, similar to what Fabio said, approach the, the education, right? ICT is no longer, you know, an extracurricular activity you know, or, or a side class to take. It, it needs to be part of the core curriculum and the core language that we all speak. I mean, we already do, right? The new generation already speaks that language. And we're putting people in developing countries at an even further disadvantage by not giving them that basic education in primary, secondary school. So I think it just needs to be part of our global education agenda and discussion. And, and I agree with everything that you know was said around maybe everybody should have a Facebook account or whatever social media account and everybody should have a computer or access to internet. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I think business has been missing from the job creation discussion. It's largely been left to governments and donors and, and civil society. I think we need a global business coalition on job creation and we need to get businesses to take a bigger role and, and greater accountability when it comes to creating the next generation of workers, um, regardless of where they're located. Great. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for all your participation. I'm going to hand it back uh, to Siddhartha, who might also just wrap up and give some indication of what all these crazy and not so crazy ideas, uh, what the next step is in terms of using them. But thank you very much for all of your participation. Thank you, Mary. And, and yes, of course, thank you all for being uh, for wonderful ideas, wonderful conversation, really very helpful at so many levels. And and just to yes, quickly summarize, uh, not to take too much time, but but really I think fundamentally the connectivity uh, that we could provide to workers around the world, uh, building up mechanisms of trust, recognition, uh, really skilling people to, to be part of this world of online employment, I think uh, these are really some of the main messages that have come out of the conversation we've had today. And, and it's such a rich discussion, I don't want to even try and summarize it uh, because I'm sure I'm going to miss something. But, but in terms of where this is going to go next, uh, the World Bank itself has uh, a billion dollars plus of a portfolio where we are working directly in the ICT sector. 
and we are in, involved in a lot of things to do with improving broadband connectivity, uh, in, including uh, things like IT skills development, digital literacy, and really trying to help governments digitize a lot of the work that they're doing. So certainly a lot of the ideas that you've shared with us today are not only going to make it into this report and the paper that we are preparing, uh, but we're also going to be thinking a lot about how this is going to influence the financing, the advising, and the partnerships that we create around the ICT sector at the World Bank. And so uh, just to really to wrap up, uh, not only is, are these wild ideas not that wild, uh, but they're really something that I hope uh, personally as well as professionally will, will lead to a conversation within our institution and with our partners around the world, including all of you, uh, to really think about how we can connect the world to work and how we can bring more people uh, the jobs that uh, are good jobs and have the positive social spillovers and really help people find the pathways out of poverty that uh, that we all want them to have. So thank you all for, for participating. Really wonderful. I'm sorry that we have to cut this short. Um, but uh, we hope to continue the engagement with you and with everyone who's been online today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.